Welcome to the Emerging Workforce Needs Resources Programming in the Energy Efficiency Sector. We are excited to host you for this virtual conversation and hope that you jump right in and engage with your fellow attendees. Next to the video, you will see the chat window and Q&A features. Use the chat video to message other attendees watching alongside of you. In the Q&A window, you can answer questions posted by session presenters or direct a question to them. You'll also have access to workshop materials on the session page. And with us today, we have Allison Moe, Project Manager at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NRO. Allison's work at NRO focuses on workforce development and community engagement projects, programming, and other activities that support equitable adoption, deployment, and access to clean energy technologies and processes. Also joining us for this conversation, Brent Cossack, Managing Director at Service Year Alliance. As Managing Director of Programs, Brent is responsible for growing Service Year Alliance's efforts to build and strengthen relationships with partners, programs inside of service field. And with that, I'll kick it over to you and Allison and Brent. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, you can see our lovely photos here right next to our videos. But uh, as, as Victor mentioned, my name is Allison. I work at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We are one of 17 national labs that are funded uh, largely by the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, my work at NREL focuses on mostly on workforce development and community engagement related to energy efficiency and other clean energy technologies. Uh, prior to working at NREL, uh, I worked uh, for Habitat for Humanity for many years. I also worked for a low-income solar installation nonprofit called Grid Alternatives um, and worked as a city planner as well uh, in Colorado for a couple of years. Uh, I'm also an AmeriCorps alumni, and I 100% credit AmeriCorps with um, sort of setting me along my career pathway. So I'm very excited to be here today and talking about this. Uh, and I'll let Brent introduce himself. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, again, uh, Brent Kosick, Managing Director of Programs at Service Year Alliance. Uh, about halfway through the presentation, I'll give a whole run through about uh, the work of our organizations for anybody that is not familiar with Service Year Alliance. But for now, I'm just wanted to say, uh, happy to be here. I've worked for several uh, conservation corps before and been kind of involved either directly or indirectly with the core movement uh, my entire professional life. So really passionate about environmental stewardship um, and just looking forward to today's conversation. Uh, like Allison, I'm also an AmeriCorps alumni and also credit um, that experience with kind of the career path that I ended up uh, pursuing as well. Awesome. Thank you, Brent. Okay, so the plan for today, uh, we're first going to share information and resources <clears throat> that can help cores incorporate energy efficiency training, education, and career connections into their programming. And then second, we want to be able to provide an overview of those resources that can help further infuse energy efficiency program into current models or assist with standing up new programming in this area. Uh, in terms of an agenda, I'll start by presenting some current statistics on employment uh, and energy efficiency, opp new opportunities for the industry, uh, sort of a sample of what career pathways could look like, uh, and then some training and education resources uh, to get you started. And then Brent will take over and present on some exciting new frameworks that Service Year Alliance has been working on, uh, again, to help CORS more easily incorporate this type of work into their programming. So with that, uh, I'll start again with the with data about what the energy efficiency workforce looks like in the US right now. So um, as background, uh, a lot of what you're going to hear today from me uh, comes from a report that I put together last year for the Core Network, working with Victor, who you heard from earlier, um, through the Core Network's participation in something called the Better Buildings Workforce Accelerator, which is a DOE effort I helped to manage. Um, but the report that you can see pictured here, and there's a link to it as well, was designed to provide information to core programs on um, career and career pathways and energy efficiency, knowledge, skills, uh, and certifications for those pathways, and then the resources available. So again, this, is, this report is uh, open and available to all, and it's really the basis uh, of what I'm going to talk about here today. 
so according to the most recent job data that was published last year, uh, there are more than 2.1 million energy efficiency jobs, and those are located in 99% of the counties in the United States. So these jobs are everywhere. Um, and I think what's important here, and you can see in the main graphic there, energy efficiency jobs really dwarf employment totals in, in other related sectors, uh, maybe most notably the fossil fuel industry, as well as jobs involved in, uh, you can see TDS, the transmission, distribution, and storage of energy. That's everything about how our energy is created and, and moved to where it needs to be. Um, so uh, although the current jobs total in the US is actually still lower than the pre-pandemic, uh, highs back in 2019, energy efficiency sector job growth um, for the last few years has outpaced uh, the US employment growth overall. Uh, on that graphic on the top right of the screen, you can see that racial and ethnic diversity uh, in the energy efficiency industry is, is pretty similar to, to what we see for national averages, um, though the lower graphic on, on gender shows that there's a pretty um, sizable gender gap uh, in the energy efficiency industry. And this is really a reflection of uh, the lack of gender diversity in, in construction and manufacturing industries more broadly, which make up a key sort of sector of this of this overall industry. Uh, and you can see that here. So this slide shows a couple of breakdowns of the types of jobs that are available in energy efficiency. So more than half, 54%, um, are in construction. And almost half, 49% uh, are in HVAC, which if uh, you're not familiar, is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And I'm going to talk a little bit more later about what those kinds of careers look like. But um, the other jobs are in manufacturing, uh, things related to building materials, uh, energy efficient appliances and lightings, lighting, uh, and then professional services, things, people like architects, engineers, that sort of thing. Um, I do think it's important to, to point out construction and, and HVAC, uh, not only are the sort of biggest portion of those jobs, but they're also the areas that have seen the highest levels of job growth in recent years. And I'll talk more about why we'll probably see more of that type of growth growth in the coming years. Um, and at the same time, more than 90% of these of these employers report report difficulty in finding and hiring qualified workers. So again, really, really a key opportunity area here. Um, there's the you can see the graphic there showing that difficulty in hiring. Um, in terms of wages and benefits for these types of jobs, the data you see here is a little bit uh, old at this point. It's it's the most uh, up to date I have for the nation as a whole. Um, it's 2019 data that was published in 2020. I think the trends are still relevant, even if the precise numbers aren't. So, as of 2019, the median wage for energy efficiency workers in the U.S. was $24.44, which was higher than the national median by a fairly significant margin. Uh, in addition, the majority of this workforce had access to either full or partial health care and retirement benefits through their employers. Um, but I think what you can see if you're able to look here, and again, this information is all in the report that you can dive deeper into, is that there is a lot of variation uh, in all of these numbers, uh, depending on the specific occupation within the industry. Um, so we'll dive into those in a, in a little bit. Um, those are all information about about the industry today but as i alluded to um, there is a lot of in change a lot of change that is anticipated for the buildings energy efficiency industry in the coming years so um, as you can see on this screen in 2021 congress passed the infrastructure investment and jobs act iija sometimes it's also referred to as the bipartisan infrastructure law or bill lots of acronyms. I'm going to try to keep them clear. Um, but the IIJA uh, provided historic levels of federal investment in um, energy efficiency for a number of different types of buildings, school buildings, residential buildings, uh, manufacturing related to, to those things, uh, as well as sort of supporting the nation's energy infrastructure, which is sort of what I talked about before, how energy is generated and moved to where it's needed. Um, and there was also funding in this act specifically for uh, training. 
Uh, and then in 2022 came the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, or IRA. Uh, among other things, this legislation uh, is providing federal funding for consumer rebates for residential energy efficiency technologies, um, things like uh, insulation, heat pumps, appliances, all, of, all that sort of thing. And then layered on top of that, there is the Federal Justice 40 Initiative. This is something that was created through an executive order uh, in early 2021. Uh, and it has the goal that the benefits of 40% of uh, key federal investments will flow to disadvantaged communities. So taking all of this together, there is really a lot of opportunity here. Um, I've got a stat at the bottom. The nonprofit uh, Blue Green Alliance estimates that uh, nearly $100 billion in energy efficiency investments from, from the IIJA and the IRA um, could create millions of jobs over the next 10 years in the US in these sectors. And given that the industry is still recovering from the effects of the pandemic, still struggling to find workers, I think this is just a, a really good area for core programs to start investigating. So uh, next I'm gonna talk about what are the actual types of jobs that could be supported? Um, what what might career pathways look like for core members when they complete a term of service? You know, I talked broadly about construction or or manufacturing jobs, but more specifically, what could those what could those um, jobs look like? So I'm going to share some sample career pathways from the green building industry, from the HVAC industry, from the manufacturing industry. Um, and, and these are based on information that's found in some interactive online career map tools. And I'll show screenshots of those that were funded by the Department of Energy. They're just a really great um, tool for core members to be using if they're exploring career options in these fields, um, but also for program managers to explore as, as you're sort of looking into these things. So. First off, you can see here the green building career map. Uh, this was developed by IREC, that stands for the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. Um, Brent's going to talk a little bit more about work that he, his organization is doing with them in a bit. Um, but here you can see a screenshot of the career map. So what this tool does, uh, it's a, it allows you to navigate potential pathways from an entry level job. So you can see this moves from entry level on the bottom up to more advanced um, jobs across the top. And then it's organized into these different vertical pillars uh, or industry subsectors. And, and here you can see these are architecture, building operations, commercial construction and retrofit and residential construction and retrofit. Um, any one of those those white dots that you see there, if you click on it, and I've got one sort of highlighted on the bottom of the screen in that screenshot, but um, you know, it gives you a little description of whatever that job is, which is great. And then there's a details thing, and you can get all sorts of information on that particular occupation. But it also shows you this sort of spider web of where you could go from there. And what's great is, for, especially for a lot of these entry level jobs, but for for occupations all through this career map, um, it's not like if you start in residential construction, you're stuck in residential construction, right? There are um, connections to and pathways through careers that span all four of these sort of vertical pillars, residential, commercial, building automation, architecture, and engineering. Um, and you know, the, it sort of shows these progressions. You can get experience in this job, and it will lead you to um, give you the skills and the knowledge that you need to get these other positions and sort of natural pathways that way. Um, so next, I'm going to showcase some of these sample pathways that have relatively low barriers of entry, meaning they would be great entry level jobs for people who are just completing a term of service. Um, and, and so we're going to start there. So the, the first one uh, is actually the job I had highlighted on the last screen. So this is for a, a pretty well established career pathway called Home Energy Professionals or HEP. Um, and this is a sequence of uh, a sort of career sequence that's used by the Weatherization Assistance Program um, or WAP. Uh, WAP is a federally funded program that uh, offers energy efficiency improvements for uh, the homes of low income residents. And, and the goals are to improve health and safety uh, and then reduce of the home and then reduce uh, energy and utility bills. So the, that, that program operates in almost 800 locations across the country in all 50 states um, and, uh, and, and some of the US territories. Uh, and so they use this sort of uh, home energy professional sequence here. So you can see that you, uh, in the WAP world, <laughs> you would start as an installer, 
here on the left side, you know, you need no more than a year of experience in construction and, and some knowledge of building science. You can typically start making about anywhere from 18 to $25 an hour. And from there, you can move to be a crew leader, which is someone sort of running these crews of installers. And, uh, or, or you can move to be an energy auditor, which is someone that assesses a home uh, using a variety of different cool technologies and tools to understand uh, you know, what energy efficiency improvements could be way made, which ones are most cost effective for that particular home. Um, and then from there, the highest level in this particular pathway is the quality control inspector. This is kind of like a, a city building inspector, but specific to, to the weatherization program. It's someone that um, takes a look at homes after work has been done to ensure that everything has been done safely and correctly. And again, I'm running through these in, in a high level of uh, information and detail, but uh, if any of these interest you, you can dive into a whole lot more detail on requirements, uh, recommended training certifications, that sort of thing in either the report or in the career maps themselves. Um, so the next uh, sort of sample career pathway is a commercial insulation professional. So this pathway that you see here is something that's used by the insulators union, which has locations across the country. And it follows a pretty typical apprenticeship model. You start as an apprentice, um, you become a journey person after completing uh, you know, your five-year apprenticeship. That includes uh, classes, on-the-job training, uh, sort of a consistent uh, expectation for wage growth over those five years. Um, and then once you're a journey person, you can become a four person, someone in charge of large construction, commercial construction projects. And then beyond that, uh, really anyone working in the trades always has the option of becoming, uh, for example, like a city or a county or state code official or building inspector, which is kind of like what I was describing uh, on, the la on the last slide. Um, the third green building career pathway I want to talk about here is for building operations and automation, which is something not a lot of people have heard about, but is probably a familiar concept. So more and more um, large buildings and large facility, think of things like uh, office buildings, schools, uh, universities, hospitals, uh, larger industrial facilities, things like that. They rely on automated systems that help keep all of the lighting and mechanical systems uh, working in their most efficient way possible as, as a way to uh, save energy and save money for those facilities. It's kind of like the idea of a programmable thermostat, but uh, at the scale of managing all of the systems in a building. Um, so in terms of a career pathway, often you might start as just a building, I shouldn't say just, as a building maintenance worker, um, and then you can move, once you've understood things about the, the technology of those systems, you can move to being a building automation system technician, become a building operator, and an energy manager for a building or a facility. Uh, I mentioned this at the, at the beginning of this particular section that the Department of Energy has funded other career maps, not just the green buildings one that I was that was that I was talking about. So I do want to quickly move through a few other relevant career pathway examples from some of these other maps. So here you see a screenshot from the the career map. Uh, for climate control technology, which is another way of saying HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, there is a lot of overlap in this map with that automation career pathway I was describing on the previous uh, slide. Um, but there is just so much that goes on in these larger buildings and larger facilities, things involved in keeping not just the temperatures comfortable, but making sure you know air the air is clean, that you're getting the changes in the air systems that you need, um, all of that. So there are a variety of career pathways available. This career map works the same way as the green buildings one. Um, the example I've sort of pulled out just for the purposes of this presentation is an HVAC technician. So um, kind of like the commercial insulators pathway Way. This is uh, typical for a, a number of unions that are engaged in the HVAC space. So there's plumbers and pipe fitters union, sheet metal workers union, um, all sort of work in this space. But again, you start as an apprentice. Um, you can move on to a journey person after about five years. Um, and then I tried to sort of choose other ways, other interesting places you could go from there. So 
You could become the manager of a service department, right? This is someone who's dispatched to buildings and facilities to, um, to fix things and to troubleshoot what's going on with these sort of automated systems, as well as the actual uh, sort of nuts and bolts of what's going on. Um, you could manage that service department. You could uh, open your own company. You could be your own contractor. A lot of different opportunities for that kind of growth in both wages and responsibility. And then the last career pathway I do want to highlight is in the manufacturing industry. So if you remember back to my earlier slides, um, manufacturing is, is about a quarter of the energy efficiency jobs in this country. And so this career map looks a little bit different, but it works the exact same way. Um, developed by the same people. Um, so you can see you've got sort of these traditional jobs in production and assembly, um, but also jobs in the distribution of products that are manufactured, the design, the engineering, the research that goes into it. So a lot of different jobs that impact energy efficiency. Um, so the, the example pathway here that I've chosen to highlight is for a production technician, um, which again has sort of a, a relatively low barrier to entry, but this is someone who is involved in the production of the materials and the technologies used in the energy efficiency industry uh, or the green building industry. So as an example, you may start as a machine operator making 18 to $26 an hour. You can become a, a production associate, which is sort of like a middle management position overseeing um, that production work. You can become a quality technician. This is someone that's making sure all of the products uh, are being produced uh, correctly. Uh, and you could become a, a sort of a supervisor of a whole facility as well, making up to you know $50 an hour or so. Um, and I will also say that because most industrial facilities consume a lot of energy, um, the jobs I described earlier in sort of building automation and climate control and energy management are really important and becoming increasingly important in the industrial space, this sort of uh, industrial efficiency or decarbonization, sort of reducing the carbon footprint of that industrial sector in the United States. Okay. So the last thing that I want to touch on before I pass this over to Brent is um, a list of resources, and these are included in the in that core network report. Um, and, and these are resources that could help programs that may want to offer some sort of energy or energy efficiency related training and provide that to your core members during their term of service to sort of help prepare them for some of the careers I described um, in those career pathways. So, um, and again, you'll have access to these slides and can click on these links yourself. But at the top, you see that's just the, the link to the, to the main uh, report where you can get detail on everything that I've gone over here. Um, and then next, you see a, a series of resources for the home energy professional careers that I described. So again, this is the, the career specific to the weatherization assistance program. Um, because the weatherization assistance program is a federally funded program, there are a lot of resources for training and education and all of those things that are free you know they're they're pu use public dollars to, to generate and so they're free and open to everyone and so they're they're really great places to start um, and because weatherization agencies exist, exist as employers across the country um, i want to make sure to so sort of highlight some of these so um you can see the first one here is the the job task analyses or JTA, if you're not familiar with this terminology. Um, essentially, these outline um, the core knowledge areas and, and, and the critical work functions and, and the skills that are needed for each of those occupations I had shown in the, in the career pathway earlier. You have your installer, your crew leader, your energy auditor, your quality control inspector. So these sort of outline what for each of those you would need to be able to know and to be able to do to to uh to execute that job well um, the next thing is the standard work specifications or sws so this is um, whereas the other one was about the knowledge and skills this is about how you actually do the things on site so for every major task that you might do as a installer or a crew leader or something like this or an inspector um, the SWS outlines how to do it correctly. And it's all, it's a text document, but it's a great way to, um, 
you know, if, if you are a core program, for example, that's engaged in doing this type of weatherization work, it's a way to make sure that uh, everything that you're doing, that your core members are learning is being done to industry standards. Um, and again, free and available to anyone. Um, the next thing you see here are job aids. And these are a, a cool tool that was released last year. NREL helped support this work. Um, and it is specific to the most entry level position in this career pathway to retrofit installers. So basically for every one of those tasks that you have in the, in the SWS, this is like a, um, a sort of a glossy how-to manual. So it shows with photos as well as words um, what the successful completion of any one of those tasks might look like. And they're a really great tool. Again, if you're engaged in this type of work with your core members or want to be engaged, engaged for people who are visual learners and haven't done this work before, it shows a picture of like what it should look like, what it shouldn't look like when it's done and is a great training tool um, in that way. Um, next is the Installer Badges Toolkit. So this is, again, see all of these things are sort of weatherization specific, but could be used and adapted in different ways depending on the work that you're doing. So um, this is sort of a, a, a micro-credentialing project is what we call it, but um, it's a tool to help organizations track and assess the skills related to weatherization um, for trainees or entry-level installers in a, in a consistent way. So there are 25 badges that uh, represent the sort of different types of tasks a person might do in this in in this field. It's aligned with the SWS, it's aligned with the job aids um, and the JTAs and all of that. But it basically is something you could download and use to track the types of hands-on skills that your core members may be gaining throughout the year that are relevant to this industry. Um, another way we've seen people use this is, is you can use it as like an early, if you're having early stage conversations with employer partners, for example, you know, you can ask them like, what are the tasks and the skills on this list of 25 badges that are are most important to you as an employer. And then you can kind of customize your training and education to make sure you're supporting those, those most needed tasks for the region that you're located in or the employers that you're working with. Oh, hold on. I missed a couple. Um, so uh, the next thing after the, the badges toolkit, there's a 3D house, which is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> it is a, a virtual interactive um, tool that kind of gives you a, a uh, you can navigate a virtual house, a, 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 a single family home, and it identifies, it shows sort of images of what these different retrofit projects might look like in the home. It links right to the job aids and the SWS uh, pages and things like that. So again, as somebody, you know, who's maybe never been in an attic or never been in a crawl space, you can go and sort of explore this virtually before you get into a real home, which is kind of a cool uh, first step into this. And then finally, the weatherization standardized curriculum. Um, so this is something that was developed by Department of Energy more than a decade ago when sort of the weatherization program was first standardizing these things and creating um, formalized training programs and certifications. So it's the foundation for most of the um, training that goes on in this industry. Um, but you can go and download uh, PowerPoint presentations and supporting materials, lessons plans, things like that. Um, and they're free to use by anyone. I will say that the resources haven't been updated in more than a decade, um, even though some of the other things, the JTAs and the, the SWSs get, get regularly updated. Um, so the, the sort of building science content of that curricula is not going to change. Building science hasn't really changed and won't won't really change. But some of the photos may be out of date um, and and look a little grainy or something like that. So just be aware if you choose to use this resource, um, it has its its limitations, but is a really great thing that you can take and you can do with it as you want um, to provide that training in a consistent way and sort of an industry vetted way to your core members. Um, Okay, so the last piece here, I'm not going to go through, I'm starting to run late on time, but um, there are a, a lot of other free resources re related to energy efficiency and building science that are not specific to weatherization, but are industry vetted. Um, the ones I'm going to highlight here, the first one you see here is the Solar Decathlon Building Science Series. The Solar Decathlon is a is a collegiate um, uh, pr uh, 
a collegiate competition that's that's basically about building energy efficiency um, for college students, but they're, they have a whole video training series about building science um, that is free and open to anyone. It's there's these short little video modules, really easy to digest, really easy to understand and a great introduction. Um, another one, you see the one at the end where I have the coming soon. I wish so much that I could put this on here, but it's not quite ready. But um, many of the, the careers that I talked about when I was talking through pathways have building science principles principles certification as one of the recommended or required um, pieces. So the Building Performance Association, BPA, is currently working on a free open source training that is going to teach directly to that building science principles certification exam. Um, they're hoping to have that ready and available this summer. Um, but again, that'll be things that you can that you can take. You can show the videos to your core members. There's there's uh, slides that they can follow along with and it teaches directly to like a valuable certificate certification program there. Um, and then finally at the bottom are some educational resources that are uh, a little bit broader than buildings energy efficiency. So if you're interested in sort of like what is energy or how does energy interact with different aspects of our economy and the environment and, and society, things like that. These are some resources that can give you some of those bigger picture pieces on energy, which may be um, important depending on the types of work that you're hoping to do. Uh, and with that, I am done and I am going to pass the screen over to Brent, who uh, is going to talk about some specific ways that cores can incorporate some of this type of content into their programming. Well, thanks, Allison, and a great job. Um, so first, I just want to uh, talk a little bit more about the work of Service Year Alliance. So our mission is to ensure that a paid full time year of service is a common expectation and opportunity for all young Americans. So if you really think about that, our entire job is to make sure that all the great work that you all are doing at the uh, service year program level is well supported in whatever ways that might be to help you advance your work. So we really have three main pillars that we kind of um, combine our work into to explain uh, kind of what we're doing on the day-to-day -day basis. The first one is expansion, and that's all about partnership development. Everything from... Um, building political champions, public policy work, uh, bringing in philanthropy, working with workforce development partners, anything or partnerships that we think will help um, you all advance the work that you're doing on a daily basis, that's the type of partnership that we want to help create. Second is recruitment. We're very much known to be in the recruitment space from operating serviceyear.org uh, for the past few years now. It's a common recruitment platform that uh, multiple um, branches of national service can use to help uh, recruit the young people that you're looking for. We're also in the uh, recruitment market research um, space as well. So we do a lot of like polling work, um, have um, focus groups to start learning about uh, what the young generations are, what's speaking to them, how we can take those lessons and turn it into marketing and messaging so that you can do a better job of recruiting uh, the folks that um, you're bringing to your program and bringing that information out to the field. Finally, we have our impact work. And what this is all about is bringing stakeholders together, mostly national service program, but also outside of the national service space as well, in collaborative spaces where they can work together to um, address common opportunities or take advantage of um, you know, working together to overcome challenges. We also have place-based work that we help advance with our impact community network as well. So speaking of our impact work, what we're going to be focusing on during this presentation is our climate project. And so this is a multi-year uh, collaborative project with the Cisco Foundation and also the core network serving as a advisor to the project as well. What our goals were around this project is to first identify the points of greatest leverage to help climate organizations better utilize national service as a human capital solution. Number two, understand the best practices, challenges, and opportunities in utilizing national service to address climate change. And then finally, help to develop new messaging, partnerships, and resources to advance national service field and to help to better serve the rapidly growing green economy. So this project actually formed um, at the end of uh, 2021 when we thought the Civilian Climate Corps was going to come into reality and pump an additional 300,000 uh, service year positions into the space of climate. So it was really trying to get ready for that. 
That being said, obviously that didn't come into fruition with the uh, new legislation that was passed, but it doesn't make the, the, it didn't really shift the project at all because just like Allison was framing with uh, the new legislation with infrastructure and IRA Act, um, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, core programming to continue to grow into the climate space. And we'll, I'll be highlighting that a little bit more throughout this presentation. Um, one thing to know is, unfortunately, I, I won't have the time today to really dig into some of the recruitment messaging learnings that arose from this uh, work. Uh, but we did host a town hall discussion, kind of um, providing an overview of the learning that took place of that work a few months ago with the core network. So if you want to go on their website and search for uh, their past town halls, you'll definitely be able to find uh, kind of some information about uh, what came out of the, our recruitment marketing uh, component of the project. So a little bit about how the project was advanced. So first of all, we held targeted conversations in the national service field uh, with innovative climate programs and then also a variety of state service commissions to learn just about everything there is to, um, to know about climate and service year programming, what's working well, where are their opportunities, what innovative programs are out there, but also what challenges are, are uh, coming up as well. So learning as much as we can across the sector. We really put a lot of emphasis on having a broad um, overview of the different uh, national service programs that were engaged in this uh, landscape analysis. Uh, so we tried to do uh, across urban and rural, different geographic communities, a uh, broad programming, everything from you know land stewardship with a traditional kind of climate uh, or a conservation core model, but also everything from disaster response to food systems, kind of you name it, anything that would fit in the climate space. That's where we wanted to kind of hone in our conversations and learn about everything that was great happening in the field. The second component of our landscape analysis was connecting to green sector employer associations, workforce development partners, and other organizations and agencies that are uh, advancing climate and environmental resilience uh, initiatives. The whole goal behind these conversations were be to better map the alignment between national service and then these various ecosystems. All in all, um, with our landscape analysis, we had about, uh, we engaged about 70 different organizations in these conversations and then advanced some of those conversations further with some of the key partners that arose out of the space. So out of all this initial learning that took place, what kind of rose to the top was identifying three areas of programming that provided significant opportunity for further expansion within uh, service year programming and the climate or environmental resilience space. The three program models that became kind of the focus of this project was energy efficiency, community capacity building, and rural resilience. So quickly, just to kind of tell you how we determined to focus on these three models, three programming models, we use kind of these five top determining factors. First of all, we wanted to make sure there was an opportunity to provide new information and resources regarding program models that generally fell outside of the traditional crew-based conservation core model. As an advisor in the project, we knew that the core network has been providing great resources to the conservation core world for 20 plus years now, and we wanted to really make sure that we were providing new information in the space. Second is opportunity to increase opportunity for expansion as a result of additional climate related funding being allocated in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Third was focus areas that had limited existing programming, but can be supported by existing federal and state funding streams. Four, ability to serve as an initial starting place for urban and rural communities that would like to explore how to infuse national service. Um, in order to help them advance their climate and environmental resilience goals. And then finally, present strong opportunities to establish post-service pathways for core members. So that was kind of our filtering lens that we used to kind of determine where to uh, really lean into on this project. And with these, uh -oh. and with these next slides, I'll um, quickly kind of, I'm going to quickly run through the community capacity building model and the rural resiliency model, but then I'll focus really in taking a deeper dive into the energy efficiency space. But just to give you a sense of kind of what these uh, three models are all about and how they kind of went into that determining factor list that I just uh, ran through. 
So with community capacity building, how we um, summarize, describe this as a small contingency of core members serving with municipalities, nonprofits, institutions of higher education, school districts, tribal nations, or faith-based organizations to advance a, a great variety of needs that are related to climate and environmental resilience. Um, one reason that we chose to focus in on this specific model is we do see that, especially with what you're seeing with uh, state-led CCC initiatives, the community capacity building model is often provides an opportunity as a starting point to kind of build up these uh, the ability to infuse national service into the space and develop plans, research, uh, new programming in the space, even the type of programming that can set up for uh, you know team-based conservation course to come in a little bit later on down the road to facilitate some of these projects. So with rural res resilience, um, this model can actually be advanced either through the single member placement, kind of like what I described in community capacity building or through a team-based model. Um, also similar to community capacity building, it provides an opportunity for core members to uh, really help assist with a, a, a vast quantity of different needs and service activities that they can partner with um, kind of their host sites to advance. With the rural resiliency model, there's also a, a strong focus on developing young leaders from within those local communities so that they can become the um, local kind of professionals or um, sustainability stewards in their hometowns. And then also a reason why we chose this model to emphasize is that we don't see a whole lot of rural resiliency model types currently um, uh, being facilitated in the current kind of service year market. Uh, but we do think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for expansion in the state, this space because of existing funding opportunities. All right, so now we're gonna dig in a little bit more into the energy efficiency program model. So this typically entails core members participating in service activities that are intended to reduce energy consumption in either residential housing or public buildings. Service activities can be direct or capacity building in nature and can be advanced through either a team-based or single uh, placement model. So as you can see from our description, we kind of decided to tackle this model as broadly as possible. So as I mentioned, you could have core members uh, providing direct service, like putting in um, insulation in a low income uh, family's home um, to providing education services to those same families or doing things like capacity building, like helping uh, public buildings uh, develop energy reduction plans or helping coordinate partners or community members in the space to advance the work. One reason that this program model was being chosen to be elevated is because of the multi-layered impact results that can arise from the program model. And what that really enables is it allows it to uh, be well received across a wide variety of partners and different um, stakeholder groups. So the five kind of uh, impacts that are typically achieved from the energy efficiency model is it can lead to cost savings for residents and taxpayers through both direct weatherization and retrofit services, as well as the education components of the program as well. Two, it can positively impact the health and safety of residents and the community. It can bring on reductions to CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions um, that impact the environment as a whole. Four, reduce strain on energy production facilities, and then also address workforce development needs very much in line with what Allison just kind of described as, as growing opportunities within the field. Along that same line, within the energy efficiency space, we also observe that core members typically receive a wide array of training skills and certifications that can transfer across green sector industries. So again, just uh, in alignment with those career mapping tools that Allison highlighted, we really like this model because you know, core members don't have to go to a linear path right into energy efficiency or weatherization. They can enter into careers in green construction or even education or, um, you know, renewable energy in general. So it really equips them with the knowledge, skills, and oftentimes certifications they need to enter into a few different career paths post-service. Again, there's a lot of opportunity through Congress recently passing these new me mega bills with infrastructure and IRA 
uh, that are creating a lot of additional jobs within this space. Um, and then also there's going to be an additional amount of project work that is created through those same pieces of legislation. And there's a lot of opportunities for cores to get infused in that space to really help uh, organizations with their capacity to uh, serve individuals or uh, communities that will be served through those projects. Uh, this infographic here is just actually, it's specific to Minnesota, but this is before any of those legislations were uh, passed where what it illustrates is that it would take 291 years uh, at the current pace to serve all uh, in, uh, families who are eligible to receive weatherization services through the state. So again, there's a great need to infuse some capacity in the space. And we all know that service year programs is one of the best ways of doing that. Okay, so once we kind of figured out what three focus areas that we wanted to lean into, we then brought together a group of eight standout service year programs um, advancing within these three focus areas. I would love to take the time to talk about each of these program models. We don't have the time today, uh, but they're all doing really great work in the space. Uh, we had Ampax Climate Impact Core. Civic Spark, Green Iowa AmeriCorps, Mile High Youth Corps, Power Corps PHL, Resource Assistance for Rural Environments, Rural Actions Appalachian Ohio Restore Corps, and then the Sustainability Institute. Again, leaning into the energy efficiency uh, space for this presentation today, I just wanted to highlight the specific uh, programs that participated in what we ended up calling our energy efficiency working group. So this is really the core group of programs that really advised us um, in um, learning more about what came out of the landscape analysis as far as um, successes, challenges, opportunities, uh, ways to grow the program further, ways to replicate it, things like that. So <clears throat> this is what ultimately is going to be produced out of the program or out of the project. And this is what those uh, different uh, service year programs that I just mentioned helped us advance in the work. So it's what we're calling our program model replication blueprints. And what these are all about are an opportunity or a resource um, to help create, expand, or enhance climate and environmental resilience programming uh, within those three focus areas. They're really designed to pro provide a menu of options that will allow stakeholders to consider and adopt elements of programming that will best suit the unique needs of their community. So we basically know that, you know, one model doesn't fit all and you would adjustments need to be made depending on what kind of funding you could bring to the table, what kind of stakeholders are in your community, what are the um, needs that will be the focus of your organization or the community. So again, it's not just highlighting a single energy efficiency model. It's really providing you with a plug and play tool of all those different options, everything from different service activities that can be incorporated to those stakeholders that can help you advance the work till funding, uh, anything that you would need to like pick and choose a model that would work for the unique needs of your community. So in summary, what these blueprints really are meant to do is expedite the process of either standing up new quality programming in the space or being used as a tool to expand and enhance current program models by further providing insights on practices, partners, and things like that. So again, if you're existing um, conservation core program or even um, running an energy efficiency program um, currently, hopefully these blueprints will still allow you to extract new information, new practices, new opportunities that you could potentially infuse into your program to further grow into the energy efficiency space or the, the space provided by those other two blueprints I previously mentioned. So the audiences to go along with that is, again, organizations completely new to national service programming, uh, state service commissions that want to expand uh, programming within those three fields in their state, or current service year programming seeking to um, expand or enhance their uh, climate and environmental resilience programming. Just a quick overview of kind of the information that is contained in each of these blueprints. So we start things off with program examples and highlights. And what this contains is a more in-depth summary of kind of how you define each program model. And then it extracts a few different examples of programs currently operating in this space and really digs into the things that are kind of important about what partners they're bringing in, 
uh, what kind of member uh, term types are being utilized, uh, different trainings that they're helping um, infuse into their programming. So give you a good sense of, again, all the different ways that it can look um, for infusing it into your unique community. The next session, section is messaging suggestions to communicate across broad or audiences. So this is where we really pick the minds of our um, working group audiences to really learn about, you know, we know that depending on the community, you're going to need to emphasize different parts of the program model to uh, get the right partners on, on involved. So these are all su suggestions about how you would do that. Um, so for example, if you're uh, maybe operating in a more conservative leaning community, you can emphasize the workforce development impacts that result from um, the energy efficiency uh, model and making sure that industry in the area has the talent uh, pool that they need to advance. Um, the next is the needs that are typically addressed um, and then also associated core member service activities. So this is where it really becomes that menu of options. So uh, each of these program models, really there's anywhere from, I would say about 20 different needs that can be addressed all the way up to um, probably 50 with our community capacity building program model. And so again, this gives you a further overview of all the different options you could have and allows you to maybe pick those top needs that align with your uh, community. And then um, we give insight on kind of the associated member service activities that help address those needs. We also include things like sample member position descriptions so that you don't have to start from scratch on de developing something like this for your program or if you're a new stakeholder to national service. These next elements are what we call our fundamental components to really make sure that you have a successful program design. And so these are the three elements that through our work with our entire uh, learning cohort of programs really rose to the top of key elements that you need to make sure that you get right in order to um, have some successful um, programming in, in these three different spaces. So the first one was core member recruitment. I would have to guess that everybody on this call today can uh, relate to core member recruitment is probably the number one topic that keeps uh, the service year programs up at night. So that's where we've did, uh, embedded a lot of the information that we learned from our uh, recruitment um, marketing campaigns, um, and then also um, things that are, were extracted throughout the project in general. Next up, it's centering a program design around belonging and inclusion. Again, it's kind of going one step further um, to making sure that you have diverse recruitment um, uh, strategies and really making sure that your program is designing an inclusive and belonging environment as a primary feature rather than a secondary kind of add-on along the way. Finally, we have provide, prioritizing post-service pathways. So really what we kept on learning again and again through the landscape analysis is that there's a high need to uh, develop a, a talented pool of young people to serve this kind of growing green economy that continues to grow every day. But there was also a need for service year programs uh, to learn more about how to like lean into the workforce development space. So we spent a lot of the time with our project really looking into this. And this is where a lot of those key learnings will be housed within uh, this area of the blueprint. So it includes uh, a lot of foundational tools similar to what Allison was um, highlighting, things like um, career maps, things like uh, how to speak to workforce development boards or how to form a relationship with um, employers in your local community. So some of those like foundational things that maybe us as service year programs aren't necessarily always um, have the experience in leaning into that's maybe more of what you would traditionally think of as workforce development. So we really started to infuse as many tools as possible to help you along that path. We also will be inserting um, a, a specific standalone resource for pre-apprenticeship programming. Um, so with, um, especially with the, Infra uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, there's a large emphasis on the creation or really not the creation of new apprenticeships in the space, but the use of apprenticeship opportunities um, to advance some of the different uh, climate initiatives. Um, and to make sure that there's <clears throat> quality jobs available to uh, folks that would be engaged in that kind of project work. So there's a great opportunity for cores to be uh, centered around the pre-apprenticeship work. So we've partnered with the Jobs for the Future and the Next 100 to uh, 
interview a lot of cores that were advancing in that space and then provide those learnings to kind of the steps you could take at the local level in order to infuse kind of pre-apprenticeship programming into your uh, program model as well. Um, one last thing that I would mention with um, this Pathways um, project is, again, as, as um, Allison mentioned, Interstate Renewable Energy Council has been a great partner in this work. They're really leading the way in diversifying uh, the workforce and kind of clean energy, energy efficiency space. And um, as kind of uh, the next component of our climate project, uh, we'll be partnering with them to uh, kind of further explore how to connect cores to um, employers in the weatherization energy efficiency space. And so as a part of that project, we'll be working with four um, pilot states. So there is a good possibility in the next a few months that we might be connecting with some of your all's cores to learn more about uh, what you're currently doing as far as your pathways work and whether or not there might be opportunity to further connect you in the energy efficiency employment space. All right, next bullet point on the list is, uh, this is partners that can be brought together to advance programming. Again, it's looking at all the different ways that programs can be um, advanced in different communities and then bringing all those options to the forefront. Within the energy efficiency model, we were specifically struck by the number of different partners that could be par uh, paired with cores in order to advance the work. So it's everything like community action agencies that are generally the recipients of federal weatherization assistance programming funds, uh, to state energy offices, uh, to universities, to other nonprofits, um, kind of a, a large um, variety of partners that could uh, be um, helpful in advancing this work if there's barriers that you experience with maybe tapping into like specific federal resources or something like that along the way. Next bullet point is funding that can help support project costs and training costs. So um, we partner with the Partnership for the Civilian Climate Corps to develop a um, inventory of those emerging, emerging federal accounts that are coming out of these um, large pieces of legislation that happened within the last year. And that will be a good resource for you all to help identify uh, different federal streams that will be trickling down to the state level that could potentially be used to help support um, energy efficiency programming or programming within those other two models. Above and beyond the federal funding, we also highlight all the different uh, kind of funding partners or funding strategies that uh, say energy efficiency programs across the country are tapping into to help support specifically project uh, costs and then also uh, member training and development. Finally, we get into some best practices and some suggestions for measuring and reporting impact. That goes both through like national performance measures of your AmeriCorps programming, but also internal ways of tracking and kind of communicating your impact to funders and partners. Finally, we wrap things up with budget considerations. So this is not like a full sample budget, but it allows you to really key in on um, significant costs that you should be aware of if you're thinking about um, advancing um, new programming in, in say energy efficiency space or one of those other models. We do have a few uh, appendix as part of these blueprints as well. Uh, we have a section if it's a state service commission that's innovative strategies that states and state service commissions are, are um, advancing in the climate and environmental resilience space. And then we also have a section for those audiences that are not familiar at all with national service resources, how to apply for funding, uh, kind of what funding to look at, that kind of stuff. So we do have a resource that helps guide them through um, kind of all those different factors to consider if you're trying to stand up brand new programming. So that concludes kind of the overview of our work within the private, private the project uh, or the climate project space. Um, and just a little bit more about uh, when these resources will be available to you. So we plan on um, producing and publishing those blueprints um, by March 20th. And those will all be available on our website, serviceyear.org. Um, again, those will be completely free to download and use. So we really encourage uh, both individuals brand new to National Service Program as well as current conservation cores or other service year programs to download those and extract the information that would maybe add the most valuable value uh, to your specific programming. Um, I also want to make everybody aware of that we are um, hosting another session in conjunction with the core network on the same 
uh, kind of energy efficiency opportunities um, um, within the workforce development space and then also the programming space uh, coming up here uh, a little bit later on in the, the month on March 29th. Uh, so that's going to be a virtual town hall at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time that day. And the registration link is right there, but it can be pulled from our um, presentation materials that will be linked to uh, this workshop. Uh, finally, that's our contact information for both Allison and myself. So if any of your um, programs or organizations are interested in learning more about the opportunities that exist within um, kind of the building the talent pipeline into energy efficiency programming or standing up new uh, or enhancing programming within the energy efficiency space, please feel free to reach out to um, us and we can help. We would love to have those conversations about how we can help support those efforts. Finally, you see this QR code on this last slide. Um, it links you to a two part or just a two question survey. I really hope that you all will just take a second to pull, pull out your phone, bring up your QR code scanner, just like you would at a menu on a restaurant and take that survey very quickly at the end of this workshop. Uh, this just helps with our reporting to uh, our different funders supporting our climate project and will ultimately hopefully allow us to continue this on into the future. So I know that all you all know how important those relationships are with funders, so if you would, uh, please just pull out your phone quickly and take that two-part survey. The direct link to this is also gonna be included in the, uh, the materials that are linked to this workshop. So with that, I think we've concluded our uh, presentation for the day. So I'm gonna pass it back to Victor to kind of close us out on uh, the core network's end. Thank you, Allison and Brent, for such a great presentation. As a reminder, this session and materials will be available for the remainder of the conference. The Q&A will remain open. Feel free to post your questions to the presenters or to TNC staff. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time at CoreCon 23.